Hey. That was cool. Uh, thank you for having me. Today we're going to talk about something kind of weird and not really like too technical. So buckle your seatbelts and get ready to get a little weird. Uh, so today I'm talking about this passion project of mine called Genome.js. And just to give you a warning before I get into this, I have no biology or bioinformatics experience, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Uh, some of you in the audience, and it's funny, before the talk, some people were like asking me questions. I'm like, I have no idea. So some of you are probably smarter than me about this. Uh, so if you want to like school me on why my talk was wrong after the talk, we can definitely do that. So as he said, I'm Contra. You can find me or any of my work at this stuff. Uh, I make videos of me skateboarding in weird places. So. Uh, if you have any cool spots, uh, I'm making a video for Austria for my Instagram, so come up afterwards and tell me about cool spots to skate at. I actually got kicked out of the palace for filming this video in South Korea, uh, but... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> to get serious, DNA, the essence of life, is our shared source code. DNA is the blueprint for all of our biological processes. Everything about us as humans is essentially the compiled output of this source code. Genome sequencing provides a glimpse into ourselves and lets us discover things we never really thought to look for. Knowing others is wise, but knowing yourself is enlightenment. Stole that quote. <laughs> no attribution because uh, it's kind of muddled who actually said that. Uh, anyways, last year, I did this thing where you get your genome sequenced by 23andMe. So they mail you this little package. It comes in a box, and you get a tube that you spit into. And then you seal the little thing, and you put it back in the return envelope or whatever, and you stick it in your mailbox. It goes to San Francisco, where 23andMe is located. And a few weeks later, you'll get an email that's like, hey, we got your results back. Come and look at them. So the results are kind of cool, but not really that interesting anymore. I don't know if any of you saw this, but uh, the FDA kind of cracked down on 23andMe for the stuff that they were saying, like, you might have Alzheimer's. Well, actually, you can't say that if you aren't, like, 100% sure or you're a doctor. Uh, so they got cracked down on, and the amount of data they can actually show you is very limited uh, compared to what it used to be. So I wasn't really, like, that excited about that. Uh, the amount of data was pretty low. Like, thank you for telling me that I have brown eyes. I kind of know that already. <laughs> um, so luckily, I saw this little download link in the corner of the profile page, this little one that's hidden, because I don't think they really want you to do this, but I think legally they have to let you. And uh, when you click that, you get this 30 meg CSV file with 967,000 rows in it. Uh, so this is the data that 23andMe uses to like, come up with its conclusions that they show you. So inside of this is your DNA. So 967,000 rows, that is a ton of data. And of course, as a programmer, I was like, what is this data? I want to play with this. Um, so all 23andMe did on top of this data was develop like, all this parsing crap and logic to actually like, turn that into stuff to show you on their website. So we can also do that. We can also go through and parse that data. But first, we have to know what exactly the data is. So each row in the CSV is a unique mutation called a single nucleotide polymorphism. And that's kind of a tongue twister, so most people just refer to it as a SNP. So the 30 megs of data is just a diff of your DNA with the like, standard reference human genome. So it's everywhere where you have a mutation that doesn't exist in like the standard human reference. Um, so each SNP has a unique ID and a value. The value is like your A's, T's, C's, and G's that you learned about in like biology class in high school. Uh, so at a high level, you can kind of think of it like a key value store. Like almost think of it as like LevelDB or Redis. Or for JavaScript developers, think of it as like an object where the key is the ID and the value is just the value, so your C's and G's and T's or whatever. So where it starts to get interesting and a little more complicated, one mutation or SNP 
isn't exactly like a direct link to a physical output. Like there isn't just one SNP for brown eyes or one SNP for blue eyes. Uh, multiple SNPs combined are what result in these more complex characteristics. So to describe this logic, uh, people came up with this concept of a genus set, which is like uh, kind of the if condition for determining if these characteristics exist. So in this example, we want to know, is this person immune to food poisoning? So this is pretty vital uh, information for figuring out if people should go on a carnival cruise or not. So from a PR standpoint, if you work at carnival, like you can determine ahead of time whether people are going to get food poisoning on your cruise. And you can limit those people to not go on your cruise. So the logic for this one is pretty simple. This one actually is just one SNP. Uh, if they have the SNP RS601338 with a value of AA, life is good, they're immune to norovirus, which is the most common type of food poisoning. So when I ran my uh, stuff through this, I actually found out that I have this mutation, which means now I can like go to Mexico City and eat street tacos and not have to worry about getting sick, even though I still got sick from that, but. Uh, <laughs> kind of a false sense of security. So norovirus immunity is like one of the easier genus sets. This is another example of one. So you can see it starts to get really complex and we have a lot more logic. So uh, I think this one involves a total of 32 SNPs and like a couple of ifs and ors and at least. So kind of more complicated. You can view a community organized uh, set of like these genus sets, SNPs, and all the research associated with them at this website, Snipopedia. Kind of difficult to pronounce that one or figure out that that's how it's supposed to be pronounced, but I've heard it as Snipopedia before. Uh, so the work that like I did with this library and all of this stuff that I'm telling you about would not be possible without this website. This website taught me like everything. So uh, serious props to the people behind this website. They get my Yo, Y'all Are Dope Award for 2015. <laughs> so basically, you can look up any SNP uh, and see what it does, or you can look up a genus set. So like GS256, these also have IDs, the genus sets. Uh, like this one, I think, is for eye color. Uh, it'll tell you like the formula for it. And then you essentially just go and convert that to JavaScript to actually go through and like run through the data and determine if a person has these characteristics. So with these resources, we can start analyzing our own DNA, and we can find out stuff like what diseases we're prone to or what drugs aren't going to work on us. So if you go to the hospital and you like had a rusty nail in your leg or something, maybe the drug to treat that like isn't going to work on you. So it's good to know that ahead of time. So if you go to the hospital, like they have your DNA, and they're just like, oh, well, we know that this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work, so we'll use this one instead, instead of like you dying from a rusty nail in your leg, which is like a totally preventable thing. So there's a lot less practical stuff, like if you're just curious about it, some people find this cool. Uh, like where your ancestors came from, how fast you metabolize caffeine and alcohol. So if you find yourself like drinking a coffee and you're up for two days, like that can be explained by looking at this file. Or you like take one sip of a beer and you just like are hung over the whole next day and uh, that's also explained by this. Or maybe like your cheeks get flush and red when you start drinking. Like you can just look at this little file and determine like why is that happening to me. Um, so you can also do something like this. <laughs> you can compare yourself to celebrities and see how similar you are. But in this example, I wanted to see what it would look like if me and Donald Trump had a kid. Uh, and this was the <laughs> this was the output with it. Um, so this is using a website called makemebabies.com. And they just like take two photos and merge them. Uh, but in the future, you could like upload your DNA and like merge it with other people's DNA and it'll like do a 3D reconstruction of like your kid. And you could even do like age progression and stuff. Like what will our kid look like at 20 years old? Or like, what if I had a kid with like Will Smith? What would that look like when he's like 45? Like this is all possible within the realm of uh, just like looking at the data and coming up with the 3D models. So one project I want to work on really soon is using 3JS and this data to like do a 3D rendering of a person's face in the browser, like based on their DNA. 
because I think that would be kind of cool. Another idea that I want to propose, uh, I think that the implications of understanding this data reach into web application development as well. So I want to live in a world where like, I can put my thumb on my phone and I can authorize certain like, chunks of my DNA to apps so they can use it to like, basically use me as a piece of configuration. So uh, it, I think it would work kind of like the permission system for apps already. It's like, hey, this app wants to know uh, your muscle performance or something, or this app wants to know your food allergies. So imagine just like opening up Yelp and you like, hey, we want to know your food allergies, put your thumb on your phone keypad and you boop, it's like, cool, we're going to filter out so we don't send you to places where you're going to die if you eat something. <laughs> uh, and I think stuff like that is really cool. Uh, it really is fascinating to me uh, that we like can do this now. It seems like some really like futuristic stuff. So some other use cases, uh, Google knows you have sensitive eyes. So when they give you driving directions, like they won't route you facing the current position of the sun because they know you'll just get like blinded and like swerve and crash into somebody. Uh, Apple knows your muscle performance. So if like they're giving you walking directions to a restaurant, like you, hey Siri, how do I get to so-and-so place? Uh, it won't walk, like take you up steep hills and stuff. Uh, so it's just, Kind of cool, like small little enhancements like that, I could definitely see being a thing. So then there's the obvious stuff, like I just said, Yelp will filter out restaurants, but like if you have a gluten intolerance or something, or it'll say, uh, hey, we know that your taste buds are like this, so you will absolutely love this restaurant that's nearby because people who had a similar taste bud uh, stuff in their genome also like this restaurant. So we start getting into like cool recommendation engine type of stuff like that. Um, and we haven't really fully researched like how deep the SNP stuff goes, but like if you think about something like Netflix too, like, hey, people with these same SNPs as you also liked this movie, you should watch this movie because people with similar DNA loved that movie. Uh, so when you start thinking about like recommendation engine, it gets even more interesting. One that I really want is uh, a calendar thing. So your calendar knows how fast you metabolize caffeine. So if you check in on Foursquare or something, or I guess everybody uses Swarm to check in because they split that out or whatever. Uh, if you check in on Swarm at a cafe, it'll be like, hey, don't drink any coffee because you have this thing later and you're gonna be like all jittery if you drink this coffee right now, like you should do it later. So like preventative stuff like that, like, hey, don't drink a coffee right before you give your talk, otherwise you're gonna be like all strung out. Uh, so I think that would be pretty cool too. So right now this field is kind of the Wild West and there's like an insane amount of research uh, that still has to be done before. This is kind of a feasible thing to do, but I just wanted to plant this idea in everyone's heads today. Like I think this is definitely gonna be a thing that people are doing like 10 years from now, sharing your DNA with like an app to like configure it, I think is totally doable. And I want like all of these engineers in this room to start thinking about doing that in your app. How could you use DNA to fuel like your app or make your app better or have a better user experience uh, for your people who use it. So one more idea. I think we should start hacking our DNA, which was kind of the title of this talk, was hacking the human genome. So we might not be able to merge the changes in and deploy to production, but don't you wanna be ready for when we can? For example, the SNP RS6152 has a research link to male baldness. If your value for this key is AA, you won't go bald. If it's GG, you will go bald. So wouldn't it be cool if you could just look and say, ah crap, I'm gonna have male baldness 10 years down the road, and then you just go swap it out. So that's exactly what I started doing. <laughs> So I have one file uh, with my current DNA and one with my ideal DNA, and I take pull requests for my ideal DNA. <laughs> so if somebody's just looking, you know, as people do, like, oh, I'm gonna go just browse this person's DNA on GitHub, uh, and they see something that they wanna fix, they can just go send me a pull request. Uh, and that usually results in like really funny GitHub issue threads, <laughs> where I'm like, well, actually, I think I do benefit from having slower muscles. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this muscle performance one right here, uh, 
It's RS181573, the little green line. And this controls a protein called alpha actinin 3. So if you have a value of TT, your muscle endurance is like pretty crappy. If you have CT, it's like about average. Uh, if you like could be a sprinter, if you like practice and like worked out and stuff, you could compete in like sprinting competitions. Uh, but if you have the value of TT, you're like Usain Bolt, like you just can run like naturally, you just have super good muscle endurance. Um, so right here I switched mine from CT to CC, which means now I can just like go race people all the time. I'll just like challenge people on the street to races. So this is a cool project. It's a little creepy, but also kind of fun. <laughs> Uh, it's called Stranger Visions by Heather Dewey Hagborg. And basically she set out to create portrait sculptures from genetic material collected in public spaces. So the theme of the project was supposed to be like a creepy overreaching government could use this for like surveillance tactics. But I don't really agree with that because I don't think that the government will ever be competent enough to do that or like technically competent enough for that. So maybe I'm just a glass half full kind of guy. Uh, or maybe there never was a glass, whatever. So the first portrait uses a cigarette that they found on a street corner in Brooklyn. And after extracting the saliva, they came up with this 3D reconstruction. So it's kind of the creepy part is like somebody could just, hey, who littered this cigarette? I'm going to reconstruct their face and then I'm going to wait and see if they come back to that corner and like confront them like, hey, you, I found your cigarette, but <laughs> You little punk, you don't litter around my fucking block. <laughs> um, but it is kind of creepy, because like, let's say I pick up this glass right now, like I leave a little bit of sweat or something from my thumb on this. Like somebody could like do a swab and like do some CSI stuff, like blah, 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 and then like come up with a reconstruction of like who was drinking out of this cup. Uh, so there's like some, there's some crime fighting like aspect to this, this research as well. But I think it might lead to this. Possibly one day. This is actually a real uh, article about a motorcycle litter vigilante in Russia where people throw trash out the window and he picks it up and then chases them and then throws it back in their window like <laughs> later on. I would recommend everybody watch this video. It's amazing. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, only the best for you folks. So this example is DNA voluntarily provided, not picked up from like a random sample on the street. Uh, but this gives us like a better, uh, a better way to measure how accurate this stuff is because we actually have a real picture of him and we can compare it to the 3D reconstruction. So this is as accurate as it is right now. So this is the person's real photo and this is the 3D reconstruction. So these 3D reconstructions don't account for aging or like different environmental factors. Like maybe you got in a knife fight with somebody and like got a scar on your face. So like it obviously wouldn't be able to tell if that had happened. Uh, but it's, it's still pretty close. Uh, I think that the, the way that they do the reconstruction in this one is like they average the age at like 25 or something, which just happened to be pretty close to the age of this person. But if he was like 60 or something, it would still look like that and it would be way off. So uh, aging is, is another thing that they, they have to figure out to make these a little more accurate. So now we have the data. We have like some cool ideas of stuff we can play with it. Maybe you have some different ideas of cool stuff you want to do with it. Uh, so we need some tools to help us out. And this library I wrote, Genome.js, uh, kind of trying to be like the utility belt for dealing with this uh, genetic mutation data. So to start off, we have this DNA2JSON library. And it just takes in data from any of the sequencers. So there's a bunch of them, like uh, 23andMe, which is the best one. If you're going to get into this, definitely go through them. Uh, they're the cheapest, the fastest, and just like generally the best. Um, there's 23andMe, Ancestry.com does some stuff now too. They tried to get into the space. Uh, Family Tree, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of them. There's like 10, but this supports all of them. So if you have DNA from any of these services, you just run it through this tool and it'll normalize it all into like this JSON format, which of course we love as JavaScript developers. So you npm install the CLI, and you run it against the text of the CSV file. And basically, the output is just an array of these SNP objects. And I'm thinking about changing this soon and like moving over to like level DB stuff, possibly. Actually do it in a key value store. 
and that would definitely speed up the querying stuff because right now uh, the way the querying system works is like streaming this JSON file through like your query thing that gets generated and it's actually kind of slow. So uh, doing level DB stuff and like actually doing database queries against your genome would probably be faster and also cooler. So there's this other module, GQL, which just helps you build these queries, like I said. So right now it's the stream of JSON stuff, but under the hood it could be a database query at some point or it could support both. I'm not really sure yet. Uh, but it just gives you a way to build those genoset conditionals that I showed earlier. And in this example, we have like some nested stuff. Uh, I think this is the same one that I showed earlier, like that really complicated one that was like super nested and had all this stuff. And this is the same thing, but expressed in this uh, GQL format. And this is that simple one, the norovirus genoset of whether you can get food poisoning. So this one is like really straightforward. So it's, it's interesting because um, you can go and publish one of these as a module. Like let's say you go on Snippipedia and you find some genoset that somebody hasn't made a module for yet. You can just go write the little query and then module.exports query, and then you just wrote like a DNA analysis module and like put it on NPM for other people to use. So uh, it lets you like run your data through like this. You just take this thing and pipe it through. Pretty straightforward. Um, but here are some of the ones that are on NPM right now. You just tag it with the genoset keyword. That way when people are searching for stuff that they can run against their DNA, uh, they can just go search for that and then stuff comes up. And what's cool is when we have these modules, we can start combining them into aggregate analysis tools. Like I want to pipe all my data through all of these different genus sets and then like come out with the results. So that f like facial reconstruction thing I was talking about like making that would be pretty cool would just be like one of these aggregate analysis tools that pumps out a bunch of results and then spits that into like a 3JS function, like take f results and like output a model or something. Uh, so this is, essentially how you would start that process. Sorry, thanks folks. Um, so yeah, these aggregate modules go on NPM too. So for example, you make a module called face and that takes in DNA and then outputs like a face object of all the characteristics. Uh, you could also make a module called diet that outputs like all of their dietary restrictions from these various genus sets all over the place. So this is where you like your integration point will be for application development or however you want to use this data. So far we have a way to convert the data, a tool for querying the data and a few pre-made queries on NPM, but this is pretty far from being a bustling ecosystem. So I need all of your help to make this a reality. If you want to get involved, you can start by simply going on Snippipedia, finding stuff that people haven't written modules for, and converting them into JavaScript. Uh, publish them on NPM so other people can use it, make the community a better place. So the more genus sets we have on NPM, the more we can all do with this data, like with those aggregate tools. So I'm hoping that with enough help, we can create kind of like an open source community powered 23andMe. I don't think that it's right that like tw this company is making like millions of dollars by just looking at like your data and like telling you what's in your data and like trying to close that off because they have their own like proprietary research and stuff that they're doing and not sharing with the rest of the scientific community, which I think is total shit. Uh, so I want to like, totally like ch get rid of that. I think that's stupid. They shouldn't be making money by like obscuring information from the scientific community. So by like doing this open source stuff and making sure that people can like actually use this research to make cool stuff, we can kind of take 23andMe out of business, which means that like we're putting the power back in the hands of the scientists who deserve it. So just really quick, I want to rejoice <laughs> of how awesome this tech actually is. So I want to walk through like how they actually sequence your DNA. So first, they chop a piece of your DNA into a million pieces, which of course is like, that's pretty crazy. Uh, then they wash it over this thing called a bead chip, which has millions of microscopic, specially crafted hooks 
that attach only to specific DNA fragments. So that means that there's like this little microscopic thing that they made for every single one of those 967,000 rows in the CSV. There's a little thing that was specially crafted to fit that row. After the beads get attached, they introduce this chemical to make them glow and get an image like that. Then the computer looks at these glowing fragments and concludes like which ones were hooked and they use that to generate the file with your mutation data. So this is what one of those bead chip looks like. And it's pretty crazy how small it already is considering like there's 967,000 little things in it. Um, but it, they're getting smaller every year too. So I think maybe 10 or 20 years from now, like and this is a totally like off the top of my head prediction, uh, but I think that 10 or 20 years from now we could see a thing where like one of these is in your phone and like you can scan your DNA. Like you think unlocking your phone with a fingerprint is cool, unlocking a phone with your DNA is like way crazier and way cooler. Like screw having to like f put all your fingers in your iPhone database or whatever so it recognizes your pinky finger. Like touch your elbow to it or something and it'll still unlock it because it'll do it based on your DNA. I think that's super cool. So this is the cost of sequencing your DNA and you can see it's like totally dropped recently as people have become more interested in it and there's a lot more money in this space. I think with like all of these bigger companies getting involved, they're like really improving the technology and, and piping money into that. So right now uh, you can do genome sequencing for under $100 and it's gonna continue getting cheaper. And that 100 includes shipping and stuff too. So no matter where you are in the world, you like spit in a tube and send it. So it includes all of that as well. So it's still actually pretty cheap and affordable. Uh, it used to cost like crazy amount of money. Like even 15 years ago, like $100 million, like that's, that's pretty crazy. Uh, but it's come down pretty quick. Finishing up my talk super early, but I knew that that was gonna happen. That's all I have to show you. Uh, the talk was supposed to show three things. I wanted to interest you in the data, provide the means to get the data, and then give you the tools to play with the data. So hopefully I got you thinking about like some fun projects you wanna work on. If anybody has like any questions, find me afterwards. No questions. Cool, thanks for having me.